of God in Christ, a house of love and restoration where a stranger meets a friend and a sinner meets God. We are going in today, or we are today having our morning glory. And for our message today, we're going to talk about shaken but not moved. Shaken but not moved. In the time that we're living in right now with the coronavirus pandemic um, touching our lives, touching the lives of our country, touching the world, the church needs to understand that we can be shaken, but we don't have to be moved. For our text, we're going to go to Acts, the fourth chapter, starting at verse 23. And before we do that, shall we pray? God, we thank you this day. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your kindness, your grace, your mercy. You've been so good to us. You've been so kind and you've been so wonderful. God, I thank you because you opened doors. I thank you because you made ways. I thank you because uh, you, because of you, we are able to be who we are. And for that, we say thank you. Now, God, I ask that you minister to me. Minister to me as I minister to your people. And because you're doing that, we say thank you. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them is. Who is the mouth of the servant? David has said, why did the heaven, the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? And the king of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast appointed, who thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatening, and grant unto thy, unto thy servants that all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and the signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Let the Lord have a blessing to the reading, the hearing, the doing, and doers of his word. Now, the portion of our text, the background text that I read before you, was Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. But I'm really going to deal with the entire, the retire remaining, going down to verse 37. I have an acquaintance who started a church that was so successful that they had a difficult time finding a place to meet for their Sunday services. They had so many people showing up on Sunday. They were literally standing in the parking lot waiting for a seat for the next service. The church was located in an area where land prices were very expensive, next to a Costco, and for a price that they could afford. They found a building. When they approached the owner of the building to make an offer, the owner told them, there's no way in blankety blank that I would ever sell this property to a bunch of Christians. Okay, so the church moved on and kept on looking for property. Two months went by, then four months, then six months. There was not anything on the market remotely viable 
for the church to meet in. The search was then hampered even more when the city that they were located in created a number of zoning codes that made it almost impossible to build a new church. People were receiving parking tickets on Sundays. The city was not happy with the heavy traffic and the fire department came out on Sundays to make sure that the inn was not overcrowded. In spite of all the obstacles against them, the church continued to grow at a fast pace. Still, as they grew, neighbors filed complaints against the church because of so much traffic. City officials continued to threaten to take action against the church. The very thing that created success in the church became the greatest liability, loads of people. The church leaders were at a loss of what to do next. So, of course, they went to the one thing that they knew that they could handle, and that was prayer. After they prayed, a phone call came. Remember that building next to the Costco that they had been looking at? That's who was on the line. Circumstances had changed for the building's owner and the man who would never sell to a bunch of blankety blank now offering the building to the church at a price reduced over 40%. He even offered to help them with their finances. Prayer can work things out. Imagine that. Who would have seen that coming? Here in our text this morning, we have a similar situation. The apostles are directing a new church plant in the city of Jerusalem. This church plant is widely successful. In a very short period of time, within weeks, the numbers had risen from 120 to 10,000 people. At that time, the believers met at the temple in Jerusalem. I would venture to say that there may have been times when there were more believers in Jesus Christ worshiping at the temple than there were people who did not follow Jesus Christ. But the success of the church became a liability. The public actions of the church takes also in the city. Great, tremendous growth in the city, in the church. But the public actions the church takes also create problems for the church. Do you remember when Peter and John created an incident or create an incident? When they, by the power of the Holy Ghost, heal a man and many people gather to hear the gospel? Peter and John were arrested because they had caused the ancient equivalent of parking problems at the temple. So. We see the officials in charge threatened the apostles. The religious officials tell them to stop talking about Jesus or else. It's kind of funny. But that's their threat. Now, wait a minute. Let me stop. What do the apostles do? They go talk to the other believers about the situation. They talk to God about their troubles. They acknowledge that God is in control in spite of the circumstances, the current difficulty. Then they ask God to fix the situation. Oh, wait a minute. I just made that last piece up. Because they didn't ask God to fix the situation. I confess that sometimes many people, when they pray about a situation... It comes up in their life. Well, ask God to fix it. Well, do you do that? Do you ask God to fix your situation? Whatever we say to God in our prayer and however we say it, somehow as Americans, we always seem to end up asking God to fix the situation for us. Lord, change the situation. Lord, please fix this whole mess. We're praying the wrong prayer. Take a look at verses 29 and 30. What do they ask for? This certainty doesn't sound like how they might pray that it does. They ask God to enable them 
which means they ask for the Holy Ghost to work through them. They ask for courage to listen to the Holy Spirit. And then they ask God, ask that God continues to do exactly what made the religious officials threaten them to do more miracles and wonders. You see that? It's incredible. Instead of asking God to remove the situation, they ask God for more of the same. It's as if they dare God to make things worse. It's like they lost their mind. Why would they ask God to continue doing what he's doing when that's creating a problem for them? Well, if you trust God, then you've got to believe that God knows what he's doing. See, remember, our job is to win souls for Christ. It doesn't say that we're going to be comfortable. It doesn't say that everybody's going to like it. As a matter of fact, when, the, when, the, when souls are being saved, the enemy gets angry. The enemy comes out with all the ammunition, with all the big guns he can. The enemy tries to stop us every chance he can. But my prayer is, God, don't stop the enemy. Continue doing what you're doing. Because when you're doing what you're doing, saves are saved. You, you get to, souls are saved. You get the church and you get people to start to wonder who you are and to think about all the power that you have and to start to appreciate you and they want to come to you. Huh. It's incredible. Yes, it sounds crazy. At least when we're looking at it from a human standpoint. Heavenly Father, I have neighbors threatening me, people gossiping about me, and life really is in the pits. Please give me your courage. And by the way, keep on doing the things that you're doing that make everybody angry with me. Amen. Yes, this is what we ought to do. Not a word about fixing things. Only a prayer to ask for the empowerment and the encouragement and the courage. Why is that? Well, you should know that answer by now. Every chapter in Acts, we see the same thing. The book of Acts is about Jesus Christ. It has very little to do with the apostles. See, the, all the apostles were, were vessels. It has very little to do with the church. That was a place for them to gather. It has very little to do with the growing number of believers. It has everything to do with Christ Jesus. Yet, this is what's happening. A short prayer found here from verses 25 to 29 is so different from what we would pray if we were in the same situation because believers in the new church knew the problem that was coming their way. But they had a purpose. They knew that their purpose was to win souls for Christ. They had a purpose. They had a purpose for spreading the gospel. They had the same purpose that we should have today. Okay, situation comes up. We become overcrowded in the church. Well, or God allows a pandemic the coronavirus to touch our country, touch our world, have to close down the churches. What's the church going to do? Are we just going to be quiet? Are we going to say, God, take away this pandemic? No, God, give us courage. God, encourage us. God, give us what to do. God, you help us to come up with a different remedy to spread your gospel. <laughs> so what has God done? He's opened up technology. People that have never looked live or on live streaming or have never thought about how to spread the gospel are all of a sudden flooding the airways, flooding technology with the gospel. Why? Because our job is to speak the word of God. Our job, when we can, is to get back out in the community to win the loss at any cost. So if our adversaries come up against us, 
Don't pray that God change the situation. Pray that God continues to doing what he's doing. Because it says one thing. The devil is getting scared. The devil is sending out more uh, of his uh, artillery, his, his imps, his, his followers to stop you. But I remember hearing a word of God. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So what is the church going to do? We're going to continue doing what we're supposed to do. We're going to continue spreading the gospel. We're going to continue praying. We're going to continue to be the vessels to help win souls for Christ. We're going to try our best to pack the church until the church can't be packed. And then the church has to divide and another church develops and they do the same thing because that's how the word of God is spread. Huh. Well, let me ask you a question. We talked about the church. Situation is going on in the church. What about in your life? When we talk about or think about the pandemic that's going on, this coronavirus, it's affected the economy to a point that the president has said we need to shut down. The governor has said we need to stay put, stop going around, stop going to work. And Congress has passed a few stimulus packages to try to give individuals the funding not to go to work. You have to stay home. Well, what am I going to do at home? I'm going to prepare. I'm going to prepare for when I can get out and spread the gospel. I'm going to prepare for when I can get out and walk up and down the streets and tell everybody that Jesus lived. I'm going to prepare. I'm going to study my word even the more. I'm going to do some more fasting so that I can get stronger. I'm going to study my word even more because the word says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I'm going to do more studying. I'm going to do more praying. I'm going to do more preparing. So when I can actually get out of my house, when I can walk up and down the streets, when I can go back to knocking on doors, when I can go back to the grocery store and I don't have to stay six feet apart, when I can go to the mall and I don't have to stay six feet apart and somebody sees me walking down the mall and they see a peace that's on me, they see an aura that's on me and they ask me, what's going on with you? Because everybody else is in turmoil. I'm going to have an opportunity to minister to them about Jesus Christ and to give them my testimony. How when I was lost and how when things were going down and how I didn't know how I was going to make it. But the Lord made a way. See, I can be shaken by what's going on, but I'm not going to be moved. I'm not going to be moved because I know who holds tomorrow. I'm not going to be moved because I know who liveth. I know who has all power. I know where the real power comes from. And my power source is not in the government. My power source is in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to call on him to give me more and more and more. See, I just believe that this is a time that God is getting the attention of not only the church to do more and to do greater. But those who know the word, who've walked away from the word, to come back to Christ Jesus. Well, why would they come back? I'm having conversations. I have people that call me on the phone just to check on me that they haven't talked to in a while. And they're saying, you know, this thing, maybe I ought to get right. Well, yeah, you ought to start listening to the Lord. Well, you think God can save me? Do I think God can save you? Oh, yes, he can save you. Do you think I can I can keep it going? Do you think I can stay saved? Because, see, I don't want to get saved and accept Christ in my life and then act like I'm acting now. No. If you accept him in your life, you got to remember that Christ is a healer and a deliverer. 
Christ is a transformer of our mindset if we want to live right. But there's some things that we've got to do. One of the things that we have to do is we need to study our word even the more. We have to look at situations, look at circumstances that happened in scripture because they're going to happen to us. Remember the word of God says there's nothing new under the sun. So if it happened to Paul and Silas, maybe it's going to happen to you. There might come a time that somebody comes knocking on your door and says, you're being accused of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because you're being accused of that, we have to take you to jail. I don't have to fight. All I've got to do is say, well, let's go. Because you know what will happen if they take me to jail? I have another audience that's waiting for me. I have another audience that I can spread the gospel to. Even if I can't gather, I can go in my cell and I can pray and I can sing songs and I can call on Jesus. And I just believe that God will work a new work in those individuals that are in the jail, that are in the prisons, that want to hear Christ Jesus, that are just ripe for the gospel. No, God. Don't change my situation. God, don't change what you're doing. Just change me so that I can do more and more for you. Well, you might ask me a question. How can I get that burden? Or that, how can I get that passion that you have? How can I ask Christ Jesus with everything that I've done in my life? How can I ask the Lord to take control of my life? That's very simple. See, the one thing that we sometimes forget is that God loves us. Let me say that again. God loves us. Who is us? He loves mankind. That's the reason that God sent his son to go to the cross. God sent his son to suffer, to bleed, and to die because he loved us so. Because of the love of Christ Jesus for us and the obedience that he had to his father. He went to the cross, suffered excruciating pain, but he did it because he loved us. I want to remind you of something. Do you remember the scripture says why he was on the cross? He hung between two thieves, and one of those thieves asked him to remember him in eternity. Jesus stopped death to usher him into eternity. And when he did that, he, that same man was redeemed. God accepted him into the kingdom because he repented. He had done some things. He said, I know why I'm here. I've done the wrong thing. But I appreciate you being here because had it not been for you, I wouldn't have had a chance to accept Christ, to accept you into my life, to repent. So right now, you've got a chance to accept Christ in your life. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter where you are. Doesn't matter uh, that you've denied Christ. All you have to do right now is ask God to forgive you of any unrighteousness. Forgive you of not following the word of God. Forgive you for transgressing against the scripture. What am I saying? Forgive you of all your sins. Because sin is anything that is contrary to the word. Just ask God to forgive you. And if you just did that, 
God just forgave you of all of the sins that have transpired in your life. God is in the process now of transforming your mind and making you a new creature in Christ Jesus. Now it's important that you be nurtured. Well, how are you going to be nurtured when you can't go to the church right now? You can't go to the building, but cut on your Facebook live, cut on your television to gospel programming, and be fed. But don't just be fed that way. Pick up your Bible. And if you don't have a physical Bible, one of the wonderful things about technology is you can go to the app store and you can download the Word of God on your tablet, on your computer, on your phone, whatever electronic device that you're listening to me on. And then start to read it. And as you read it the more, read it again. And as you read it the more, read it again. Why am I saying that? Because that's studying the Word. I want you to study the Word so that you get it here. So when the enemy comes back against you, you don't fight. Because the scripture says, vengeance is mine. Just allow God to fight your battle. Allow God to work everything out. Not so that you are pleased, but so that God gets the glory. Shall we pray? God, we thank you this day. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your kindness. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you because you've been so good and so kind and so wonderful. God, I thank you because in spite of my circumstances, I've got a mind to serve you. In spite of my circumstances, I've got a mind to live according to your word. In spite of my circumstances, in spite of what people say, I have a double determination that I'm going to live according to the word of God. And I'm going to allow you to bless me. I'm going to allow you to touch me. I'm going to allow you to take control of my life. I'm going to allow you to do in me what you have purposed me to do. And because you're doing that, I say thank you. Now, God, I thank you because you're moving throughout the land. You're speaking to your people, both in the church and who were not in the church prior to this coronavirus. I thank you because you're being so good and merciful. I thank you because you're putting your loving arms of protection around us. I thank you because of you. You are able to do what you said you would do. And because you're doing that, we say thank you. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you just heard that prayer, if you've just asked God to forgive you, you've just allowed God to take control. If you want to know where that is in the scripture, go to Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. What you've done is you've confessed your sins. And because you've confessed them, God has forgiven you of them. Now what I'm going to ask you to do is marinate on that thought. Marinate on the fact that there are times in this life that we'll be shaken. But because we're shaken does not mean we're moved. Doesn't mean that we fall apart. If you go back and you look at this text, the people of God were shaken. The power of the Holy Ghost fell upon them. The building shook. But they didn't have an earthquake. Because when they went out and looked around, everything else was okay. It was just the power of God where they were. What we want is for the power of God to fall on the men and women, boys and girls who have confessed because the power of God, the Holy Ghost, the third person in the Trinity gives us the power to live right. The power to walk 
our walk and the power to walk Jesus and to talk Jesus and to live Jesus so that our entire character becomes one that Jesus and that God is proud to say, that's my son. Thank you for joining us this morning. And I ask that as you're thinking about this, come back tomorrow morning, Sunday. We're going to be ministering again. We're going to be coming live at 1030. So come back, hear the word, but think about the words that we spoke on today. Your situation. You're saying, what's well, tough? But God can bring you through. And before you know it, you will have adapted to your situation. And you'll have more peace than you ever had in your life. Shall we pray? God, we thank you this day. I thank you for your goodness, your kindness, your grace, and your mercy. God, I thank you for allowing us to gather together for this short period of time. Now, God, as we leave from this place, but not from your presence, I ask that you put your loving arms of protection around us. Keep us from danger seen and unseen. And God, just minister to us throughout the day. Because you're doing it, we say thank you. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen.